and bonus tip here that sometimes gets misportrayed is be in. Hey guys, in this video, we're gonna be talking about how to adjust to altitude and not get sick. Now, I'm no doctor. This video is for entertainment purposes only, but I do have a few things to note about altitude sickness that could really save your day. You might not be able to see, but back up here behind me is a peak that we were um, running around last summer and I got altitude sickness and it really put me on this train of learning more about it. Today, I wanna share those things with you so that you don't ruin your next trip to high altitude. And really high altitude is anything over 8,000 feet and then there's different tiers beyond that point. Now that always threw me off because I thought high altitude was at least 10,000 feet, but you can start feeling these symptoms as low as 8,000 feet. Now there's three different types of altitude sickness. There's acute mountain sickness, AMS, which is what most people are going to feel. Like 90 plus percent of you will have acute mountain sickness, which is headaches, nausea, achy body, um, and just things along those lines. Now that is gonna be what most of you experience. There's also haste and hape, which is high altitude pulmonary edema and high altitude cerebral edema, which means you got water in your lungs or water in your brain. And those are critical. And if you experience anything like that, where you think you have, might have blood, or excuse me, water in your lungs or cognitive abilities starting to fade, which I don't know too much about those, you should immediately get down off the mountain because those will lead to death for sure. But most of you will probably be experiencing acute mountain sickness. And so I've got nine tips to share with you today. And then I'm also gonna share what I'm currently testing out on the mountain to see if that makes a difference with high altitude. So let's dive right into tip number one. Tip number one is get good sleep up to two days prior to going to high elevation. You see the goal here is to put less stress on your body, making sure that you're showing up to the mountain in the best condition that you possibly can. So two days prior, make sure you're getting good sleep. Try to avoid being sick and show up to the mountain in the best condition that you possibly can. People don't realize this, but any type of sickness, even a small cough or a sore throat, puts you at a slightly higher risk to get high altitude sickness. Tip number three is to sleep at the trailhead. Typically your trailhead is gonna be higher than the elevation, um, down off the mountain or somewhere else. So sleeping at the trailhead does give you that chance to acclimate a little bit. Tip number four is try to take an easier day one. Day one, you're trying to acclimate. And if you overexert and put a lot of stress on your body, that can greatly increase the chance that you're going to get altitude sickness. This is the primary thing that happened to me when I was on the Skyline Trail last year and I got altitude sickness. Number five, your rate of ascent. Try to keep it lower or slower. That's the, one of the number one things that can get you sick at altitude is ascending too quickly. That's why there's so many days when you're going to some of these places, they'll take so many days to acclimate. Um, but rate of ascent is a big deal. Make sure you're watching that along with these other factors because they can compound. All right, number six, make sure to hydrate extremely well and use electrolytes. This is a massive deal. Most people do not realize that they're getting dehydrated at altitude, especially the higher you go, the more wind there is, the more sun exposure. And so a lot of times you're like, I didn't even sweat today, but in reality you were sweating the whole time. It was just evaporating off you so quickly you didn't realize it. I think this is probably one of the top reasons people get altitude sickness. It is incredibly hard to stay fully hydrated at high altitude. Most people do not understand that they're drying out until it's too late and then they're at risk. My next tip is to limit the amount of stress on your body. That's kind of an overarching theme for all of this, but really the more stress you put on your body, the more likely you are to obtain high altitude sickness. So if you're doing any of these, they all really equate back to stress on the body. So make sure that if there's other things that you can control to limit that stress in your body, you do them. This next one, I almost wanted to make the bonus tip because I have found it extremely beneficial. Now, if you go listen to our podcast, we did a podcast about high altitude where we go into way bigger detail about all of this stuff. That's the Live Ultralight podcast. But this one I learned firsthand and it's actually what helped me diagnose that I got altitude sickness. You see, we were on this very mountain range when there was not snow just covering every inch of it and I got sick and I wanted to refuse the idea that I was sick from altitude. But it wasn't until months later when I looked back at my heart rate and started piecing other things together that I self-diagnosed that I did in true, in fact, have altitude sickness. I had nausea, body aches, couldn't eat. Um, and all, all these things really led up to that. I didn't get good sleep. We ran a 26 and a half mile day with 6,000 feet of elevation. We're sleeping at about 10,000 feet. Whereas before the night before I was sleeping in the 5,000 foot range and I got behind on um, hydration. So there was three or four factors, but it was months later when I actually looked up my profile from Garmin. So I wear a Garmin instinct to watch. Um, Sorry, not the Instinct 2, that's the brand new one, which you can now get 
Um, if you're a Live Ultralight member on our website, you should be able to get that. Anyways, I pulled up my data for my Garmin watch and I looked at my heart rate and it was crazy. You see, my resting heart rate is typically in the 50s. And on this scenario, it was it didn't get below 80 all night long, which really shows that I was behind on electrolytes. My body was way overworking, way overstressed, and that really resulted in me getting elevation sickness. Um, since then, I have tracked it and tracked it. And it takes a few days typically for me at high elevation to bring my heart rate down. Um, however, as I've used a lot of these tips that I've just given you, it's significantly helped. So this tip right here is to watch your heart rate. And if you've got it, a blood oxygen monitor, but the heart rate to me is a great way to know the amount of stress you're putting on your body. If you're running at a super high heart rate all day, you're putting a lot of stress on your body. And if at nighttime when you're sleeping, you're not getting a good lower heart rate number per se, let's say if you're again in the resting heart rate is 50 at nighttime and you're at 60, 70, 80, that tells you something as well about the amount of stress on your body. So track your heart rate at high elevation. It can be a big, big benefit to know how much stress you're really putting on your body. And bonus tip here that sometimes gets misportrayed is be in good shape, be in the best shape you possibly can. Now, sometimes you hear otherwise, they say, you know, being in good shape doesn't have an effect or whatnot, but really when you peel back a few layers on that from what I've seen, it's because if you're in good shape, you typically go to high altitude and think you can just do whatever you want, like you're Superman up there. Now that's not true, but being in good shape will drastically help you to adjust to high altitude and your body's ability to cope with all that's going on as you raise in elevation. So train, watch some of our other videos on the ways that I like to train, that's going to help you adjust to high altitude and it's one that's often overlooked. Now, before you go though, I do have one other tip I wanted to share with you. Again, I'm not a doctor, this video is for entertainment purposes only, but something that I have done a lot of research on and I will continue to test this next year is actually nasal breathing. When you breathe out through your mouth, you actually lose a lot more um, water vapor or you basically dehydrate faster breathing through your mouth than through your nose. Your nose is really designed to um, may balance the temperature and to hold in some of that moisture. And there's a bunch of benefits on nasal breathing. And so I have actually started to focus on nasal breathing. And I don't know if you're able to tell, but I actually have a bruise over my nose from a device I was attempting to use uh, to nasal breathe better. Um, but that's something that I'm gonna be testing and I will try to report back on. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel because I'm sure if I find this useful, I will come back and share with you um, how to do that. In fact, I do have a story on that, but you're, again, you're gonna probably wanna go over to the podcast to hear that. Pretty interesting stuff, but Again, this video and all of these tips should significantly help you adjust to high altitude. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you're subscribed. Leave comments down below if you have additional thoughts on what can help you adjust. We'll see you guys in the next video.